Okay, we we'll continue with our study of tensors and today we are going to uh, consider the effect of uh, a change of bases. Okay, so let me put that down here. So, in the past, in the past few lectures, we've often considered uh, a basis like this one and looked at the effect it has upon our representation of vectors and tensors. In particular, we saw that once we have a basis, we can write out uh, components of vectors as well as tensors. Today, we're going to look at how to express the change in components of vectors or tensors that follows when we replace the use of this basis with another one, maybe that one, okay? So that's the basic idea of what we are going to try and do um, right away today. So, so here's the idea. We have one basis here, right? And we'll denote it as usual, E1, E2, E3, okay? We want to consider what happens if we have a different basis, right? And following the notation that we've adopted in the past, we call these, ten these vectors E1 bar, E2 bar, E3 bar, okay? As before, these form an orthonormal set and so do these, okay? So each of these forms on its own an orthonormal set, okay? So what this implies, of course, is that EI dot EJ equals delta IJ, and out here we have EI bar dotted with EJ bar also equals delta IJ, our Kronecker delta symbol, okay? Now, the way we proceed is the following. We recognize that, let's consider one pair of unit vectors here. In particular, let's consider E1 and E1 bar, okay? Now, the moment we consider two vectors in three-dimensional space, we know that there is a relation between them it's a linear relation, it essentially defines a tensor, okay? So we say that, well, there must be a tensor, okay, relating E1 bar to E1 and so on, okay? And by so on, what I mean is that in general, there must be a tensor relating Likewise, E i bar to E i. There must be a tensor relating E1 bar to E1, and likewise, you know, when we extend that idea, we say that, yes, that this tensor must in general relate any E i bar to E i, okay? So that's how we look at these bases. We look at the second basis that I wrote, the bar basis, as coming from some tensor applied to the original basis, right? The one without bars, okay? And the way we're going to denote this tensor, it's just the sort of convention we are going to follow. We're going to denote it by Q, okay? So what this means is that we say that there must exist a tensor Q, which says that, which gives us EI bar is Q EI, and this holds for I equals one, two, three, okay? All right, what, what else can we say about this tensor? Um, one thing we want to do is to make sure that this property of orthonormality, which both base sets of basis vectors have, that that property is preserved through this transformation, okay? And the way that happens is, is if the following property holds, okay? Q is an orthogonal 
transformation. All right. The way we write this out is the following. The relationship that this implies is that Q transpose Q, right? And here we are talking about just standard tensor multiplication of the type that we discussed in the previous segments, okay? So what we are saying is that Q transpose Q is equal to this tensor, which I'm going to write as a sort of bold-faced one, where this tensor that I've introduced, this bold-faced one, is just your very well-known identity matrix, if you want to go to a, to a matrix representation of tensors, okay? So um, let me just say that. Let me say that the components of this new tensor 1 are uh, 1 ij equals delta i j. Okay? So you know exactly what this means. If you want to go to matrix notation, you would write 1 as your well-known identity tensor, your well-known identity matrix, your well-known 3 by 3 identity matrix. All right? Okay. Let's now think about how we can write it using coordinate notation, right? How do we write this relation that I just put up here? How do we rewrite it using coordinate notation also with the knowledge that this is what we mean by our new tensor 1, okay? Think about it for an instant and we'll go ahead with, with, with the response here. Okay, so the way we want to do it is the following. We say really what we are thinking about is if we look at this as, uh, we look at this tensor product in terms of the coordinate representation, we are talking of something like Q transpose I J Q J K equals delta I K. And now what we're going to do is recall the fact that we have a way of writing out the components of the transpose of a tensor. In particular, we are going to write Q transpose as Q J I Q K J remains the same. And this gives us, by contraction of the J's, this gives us delta I K. Okay? Now, in general, what we're going to do through our development of continuum mechanics is that whenever we see the transpose of a tensor appearing as we saw on the previous line, we are going to invoke the fact that we can write the components of the transpose of a tensor in terms of the components of the original tensor itself using that sort of a relation, okay? So since that is something we are going to use repeatedly, let me just put it down here as an aside, okay? And what we are considering here is a tensor product of the form A transpose B, all right? And we want to ask ourselves, all right, what are the IJ components of this product? The way we will write this is A transpose IK B KJ and then recognizing the fact that we can write A transpose I K as A K I multiplying B K J, noting that the contraction is done on the K index, we are left with what we originally started with, right? Uh, which was essentially A transpose B. the i, j component of that, okay? So that's a result that we will use often as we churn ahead with our use of coordinate notation to understand uh, tensor manipulations. All right, let's get back to the main business of uh, this segment, which is to understand the effect of uh, change of bases. And, uh, okay, 
The way we are going to do that now is say, all right, now that we know what the effect of Q is, let's look at whether it really works in order to preserve the orthonormality, all right? So in particular, we want to ask ourselves if we consider E bar I dotted with E bar J, what do we get, okay? So E bar I, we recall, is Q E I, right? And E bar J is Q E J, all right? Now, we go back to something that we used in the previous segment, which is to recognize that looking at the E I basis, we know that Q acting on E I is a vector, all right? And the way we wrote that in the previous segment was as Q, Q K I, E K, and likewise, here we get Q L J E L. Okay? The idea is that Q E I is a vector which can also be expanded in terms of the bases. So the basis vectors that we're using in writing out the expansion of this Q E I vector we are using EK here, the QKIs essentially function as components, right? This is how we actually went ahead in the previous segment to even define the components of a tensor, all right? And of course, we have a dot here, okay? Now, in this sort of expression, the QKI and the QLJ are essentially components, your scalar components, so they don't really get in the way of multiplication, right? What that allows us to do is to write out this expression as Q K I Q L J E K dotted with E L using the properties of linearity of the dot product. Okay? But then we know already that because of the orthonormality of the original set of basis vectors, E K dot E L is delta K L. All right? And then what happens is that this delta KL acts upon one of these two components. Let's suppose it acts upon the QKI. It converts that to QLI and QLJ stays the same. All right? But now we know exactly what this is. On the previous slide of this segment, we defined QLI, QLJ, in fact, to be delta ij, okay? And then we bring down what we had on the left-hand side. We see that indeed ei bar dot ej bar gives us delta ij, okay? So orthonormality is preserved. Right? Orthonormality of the basis set E I bar, right? I equals one, two, three. Okay, that property is preserved.